Well, hello everyone, and welcome to what is probably Jaguar Land Rover's most controversial iteration of their Range Rover Sport, the L461. And I've started this video from this angle deliberately because I'm pretty sure this part of the car is what estranges most fans of the model. And today I'm bringing you a brutally honest review of this Range Rover Sport. It's been lent to me courtesy of The Out, who are an exclusively JLR rental service based in London. And it's given me an amazing opportunity to experience this car, use it as my daily driver for over a week now, and do many, many miles in the car. I really feel like I've understood it and I have some, I have some interesting opinions on, on the car which, which might be controversial. So if you're interested, I encourage you to, to watch on. So round to the front of the car then, and it really shares its looks with the full-size L460 Range Rover. You can't distinguish too easily from the two. Now, if we had them both side by side, it would be a little more obvious, but at a glance, it definitely shares that sort of look. However, it does have a few distinguishing features, one of which I particularly like, or two, shall I say. One is these bronze accents that are there along the lip at the bottom, and also these sort of fake grills that are on the bonnet. There's a bronze accent in there too, but I like these fake grills because from where you sit in the driver's seat, they look really purposeful and mean. And I think that's what the sport should be, if it's anything, over the full size. Now this particular model is the same as the previous car I had from the out, which was a full-size L460 Range Rover. It shares the D300 engine that that car also had. I wasn't so much of a fan of it. However, I have to say in this slightly lighter sport, it makes a little bit more sense. It's more economical, it's quicker to get away, slightly more responsive, and I've become quite a fan of the, the engine. From the outside immediately as well, it doesn't feel like a lesser car, so to speak. These are generally, across the board, £20,000 cheaper than the full-size Range Rover. And there's not that much that these don't come with as standard that they do. And at least from the outside, the back is a little bit questionable, but certainly from the front and the side and the interior, which we'll get into in a moment, I don't really feel that I've been shortchanged in terms of equipment and overall stance. It doesn't feel like a £20,000 cheaper car let's put it that way now call me old-fashioned but i feel like black wheels in general ruin any range rover and so i'm really glad that this one comes on these alloys and as an overall side profile with the color which like i say is a standard color uh, i think it looks really good it almost has a bit of a range rover evoke sort of shape to it from from the side but when you stand next to the car, it's definitely immediately apparent it's not an Evoque. It's a much bigger, beefier, bigger brother to, to that. But yeah, I love these wheels, actually. I think they really suit the car. And the fact they're not black is just even better. Now, they are large. They're 22 inches. The tyres are still relatively low profile. But we'll get into the sort of ride quality and things like that when we take the car for a, for a drive in a bit. Because you might find what I have to say a little bit surprising there. Um, as with the full size, and I think it's been on Range Rover for a little while now, we've got the handles that retreat away. So if I was to lock the car, the handles disappear. And likewise, when you unlock it, they all come out so that you can grab and open the door. When you drive away, they automatically go back in. Wing mirrors are more or less the same as on the full size car. And again, we've just got these sort of fake, but quite purposeful side grill here with the bronze accents. I do actually like the styling. I am genuinely quite quite anti-fake things, like, you know, the fake air vents. It's, it's pretty naff, right, let's be honest. But it does kind of work here, and I, I do like it. So stepping inside the L461 Range Rover Sport then, and even if you're not used to this new platform of Range Rover, you immediately know you're in one because of the warmth and comfort of the seat as soon as you sit down, and how quiet it goes when you close the doors. Like Range Rover of old, we still have double glazing all round. And well, I'll jump straight into the point that I think that is one of the best things about this car still is the silence as you drive along. But we'll touch on that a little bit more later. In terms of the interior layout compared to the full size Range Rover, it's identical actually, completely the same. There's only a few differences I've spotted. Number one is the screen, instead of being Flat is a little bit slanted towards you, which actually, if anything, is an improvement. I think it's just due to there being slightly less space in the front here and the dashboard being a slightly different shape. 
Also, the steering wheel is a different design. The steering wheel doesn't have the sort of grab holes that the full-size Range Rover has, which I think I miss, actually, because it was a nice way of resting your hands on, on longer journeys, a nice place to control and steady the wheel from. Uh, so the shape and design of this wheel is slightly different, although all the buttons are exactly the same. And I have to say, one of my major complaints with the L460 Range Rover was the responsiveness of these buttons and I don't know if there's been uh, an update or potentially just newer model year cars have been designed or, or built slightly differently but I've not had the same issue with this car which I'm pleased to say the responsiveness when clicking to change a track on the media or adjusting the cruise control and and these buttons here is it's much more responsive and not really ever been a problem in this car so that's really uh, really good news Lastly, I certainly didn't notice this on the full-size one if it was there, but there's this sort of tunnel through here. It reminds me a little bit of a McLaren or Ferrari, which is a very weird thing to say. But there is a tunnel here, which is kind of redundant and useless. Looks quite cool, but there is actually a USB-C port on the driver's side. We also have a USB-C charger under the cup holders, which is quite nice how you can hide that away, and a conventional USB 3 as well. Other usual refinements include the double glove box, which we've enjoyed on Range Rovers for a long time now. We do have this big central infotainment screen, which, like I said, apart from it being slightly angled, is identical as far as I can see. We've got the control in the middle here for the drive mode, whether that be grass, gravel, snow, automatic comfort, eco, dynamic, etc. Volume knob button, the interesting gear shift selector, and inside here, probably the best thing of all, the fridge. Now, interestingly, this is a se uh trim which i believe on the sport is the lowest you can go for i.e the, the cheapest and on the l460 i had before this that was a hse now correct me if i'm mistaken i haven't actually checked this but i believe hse is lowest that you can get on the l460 and se is the lowest that you can get on the sport so these are almost a direct comparison. And the only things I've really noticed that this thing isn't equipped with, well, off the top of my head, it's only one thing. We have the fridge. We still have the same seats and you can adjust them in the same amount of ways. The headrest can move in and out, up and down. You can adjust the lumbar and the bolster support. The only thing I can notice that it doesn't have is cooled seats in the front and heated seats in the back. So the rear passenger seats are not heated, whereas on the full size Range Rover, they were and in the front they are not cooled but they are heated but in the full size Range Rover they were both so there's your 20 grand of, of difference uh, but at the moment really in terms of equipment it's very very good um, very impressive considering and I know this sounds completely out of touch and I'm not in any way in this league I daily drive an 800 pound Volvo XC90 but at 80,000 pounds list price without any options. This equipment is very impressive, I have to say. In terms of equipment also, you do have a Meridian sound system, which is about average in terms of the, the standard sound systems out there. It's very good, you're, you know, unless you're wanting to make your ears bleed when you're driving to work, you're not really gonna be wanting for more. It's a very good balanced sound system. You have adaptive cruise controller standard as well, which hasn't always been the case on Range Rover Sport. So that's really nice. And also the autonomous steering mode, which I have to say, still not very good. I, I don't use it. I find it to be uh, more distracting uh, than it is useful. Have these lovely handles here on all corners of the car. And in the back, there's individual air vents like you'd get on an aeroplane in the top as well. So I think it's a really nice touch. We've obviously got this fixed uh, panoramic roof. So we've just got the cover that slides open and closed. We can't actually open this, which is a little bit of a shame, but that is available as an option or on higher specification models as well. Now in the last video I did with this platform, which was in the L460 Range Rover, which also came from the out, I did go into real detail actually on the infotainment system and the infotainment screen. I'm just gonna recap in this video and glance over some of the things that I feel haven't improved and some of the things I feel that have. So if you wanna know more about this, uh, I recommend you go and click up in the top right hand side of the screen now and go and go and watch that video and then come back here. But in terms of differences between the two cars, well, no, it, the system is exactly the same. Like I say, there's a few things in here we can't do that we could in the other Range Rover. The only thing I've really noticed though is the cabin lighting in the full size Range Rover, the HSE specification, 
you could adjust the cabin lights uh, colours. So you could change the colour of the, the lights that sort of illuminate the footwell and the side trims of the doors. Whereas in this, you can't change the colour. It's just the sort of kind of nasty urine coloured yellow. Not a particular fan of it, but you can dim it down at least at night so you don't have to look at it if you don't want to. So that's a little bit of a shame, but not really a big deal. Just on the screen and underneath the screen, I should say, there is a wireless charging port here, which is really conveniently placed. A lot of these wireless charging things for your phone are like hidden away somewhere where if you put your phone into it, you're probably never going to get it back. But this one's actually really conveniently placed. It's just under the screen and it's not going to go anywhere when you put it there. Likewise, it's also easy to reach once you've finished your drive. We have Apple CarPlay. We have a useful feature where you can look at your vehicle dimensions if you're coming into a car park and you're not quite sure. Low traction mode. We can look at our 4x4 data, which I quite like. It gives you your elevation. It shows you what each corner of the car is doing. But most importantly, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto come as standard, which is just all you really ever need. Only little complaint again is that you can't transfer your Apple CarPlay, say like in an Audi, to the central driver screen here. You can only use the JLR maps, which I would never use. So it's a shame they haven't done that where you can have your Apple CarPlay or your Android Auto on this central screen. That would be really nice to see them implement that. And I'm sure they could probably do it. And maybe by the next time I'm in one of these, they will. So that would be a really nice improvement. Other than that, I have to say, I've found it more intuitive this time. If you've watched and gone back and watched that first video, I had lots of complaints in terms of the responsiveness of the screen and just some of the functionalities of it. But I have found it a little bit easier to get along with this time round. And also I think there must have been some software updates because it's not nearly as hard to, to get to respond to your inputs. I will say though, just in general, if I do want to go on there and adjust where the air conditioning is being directed or want to go on there and adjust my bolster support, it requires you to take your eyes off the road whilst driving. And I don't want to get political, but I cannot for the life of me work out why it is illegal for someone to have a mounted telephone, which they're using for navigation, when it comes up and says, there's a faster route available and you, you don't want to go on that route for whatever reason, it would therefore be illegal for me to click deny and, and unaccept that route if I was driving Whereas it's completely legal for me to go into this big infotainment screen and adjust my bolster support on my seat. I think that's ridiculous and the law needs to be updated. Either the manufacturers need to bring some buttons back or they need to relax the laws on, on mobile phone use. But I don't want to get political. I just think it is ultimately distracting having to go in here to adjust quite essential things whilst you're driving. Anything else to add? Just the build quality. I mean, the seats are just effortlessly comfortable. Everything you touch and look at is lovely. I actually really like this sort of, looks like a horrible office carpet, but it feels nice and it feels clean and it feels like it's good for the environment, which I can kind of get along with. I love this soft touch fabric that's all along the top of the dashboard here. It feels really good. And the paddles as well. Not that you ever use them because you just would never use them. Maybe the only time you'd ever use it is if you were off-roading and you wanted to lock into certain gears. But Every now and then as I'm driving along, I do just like to feel them because they feel nice. I think it's such a shame. For example, Audi uh, in the R8, where you're using the paddles all the time, aren't nearly half as nice as these paddles to feel and to use. Uh, so it's a bit of a shame that the, the function of them is kind of redundant in this D300. Suppose if you did have the P530E or one of the big V8 petrol ones of these sports, then you'd probably find yourself actually using and enjoying these paddles very much so. I'd like to try one of those big petrol ones out actually because I've only had the diesels thus far. Only other thing to add is that when this car got dropped off from the out, it had less than 2,000 miles on the clock. It was absolutely impeccable and it even still now has the covers over the sort of sill plates. They haven't been taken off from new. So it's just absolutely impeccable in here and, and really amazing that I get to experience this. So if at this point you are interested in renting one of these for yourself, I'll leave a link in the description below this video um, so that you can go to the out and, and have a look at uh, renting one of these cars. It's a really seamless and, and lovely experience, actually, I do have to say. So let's get you guys inside properly, and I think we'll, we'll take this car for a drive, because actually I have been very complimentary of this Range Rover Sport so far, but it does fall down in quite a few areas, actually, once you take it out on the road. So uh, let's go and do that now, and I'll 
I'll let you know what I'm on about. Okay, so out on the road in the L461 Range Rover then, and as I said, chief among all, and that demonstrated pretty well, is the silence of the drive. That was a really loud motorbike, and although it was noisy going past, not nearly as noisy as it would be in your ordinary family car, this thing, we're doing 45 miles per hour right now, it's whisper quiet, it really is fantastic. I love the seating position as well. That's always been a fantastic trait of Range Rover, at least since the L322 generation. You can see over the hedgerows, you've got all of this glass around you, your visibility is fantastic, and despite it being a huge car, it's never too challenging to place on the road. I think one of my favorite things about driving a Range Rover of any kind though, is it changes me as a driver. Sometimes I can get involved with the hot-headedness of being in a car you want to get to where you want to go you're getting frustrated with what you'd class as poor drivers even though you're probably driving badly yourself and you just become a little bit aggressive whereas in this car it never happens to me it really doesn't it's just a it's almost like a way of being when you're when you're in this car i mean i've even tried to dress like a farmer that's off on a shoot today there's this cyclist ahead of me and normally I'd be like, oh, get out of the way, but actually it's fine. I'll just wait until there's a huge gap and I just glide on past. And I'm extremely happy to do that. I'm not at all in a rush. And actually I've said this several times to my wife when we've gone and used this car this past few weeks or so. Uh, we've arrived home or wherever we're going and I just say, I don't want to get out. And you sometimes end up just doing a deliberate detour or an extra loop so that you can stay in the car for a bit longer it really is true i mean you don't want to get out of a car like this and you sort of never arrive at your destination because you just always want to be in the car it's so lovely and i think that's probably the one trait that range rover has over any other manufacturer that i can think of yeah you simply don't want to get out of the car and it makes those journeys, those long journeys, maybe around the festive period or just in general when you've got to go and visit your family or visit your friends that you really know you should be seeing, but uh, you sort of drag yourself up the other end of the country once every six months to do it. Whereas in something like this, you'd be seeing your mates three, four, five times as much because you'd be jumping at the opportunity to do a long drive in this car. It's really, really amazing and it changes everything. There are lots of things I feel that should be better though, and, and chiefly amongst all is, is, is this, is the ride quality and the way the suspension really fidgets. I didn't notice this on the full size Range Rover. I've only really noticed it on this Sport. And it's not like the wheels are particularly huge and that would be affecting the ride quality so much. It just seems to fidget a, a ton. When you hit a speed bump or a large pothole, instead of gliding over and, and eating up the compression, it really smashes into it and it gives you a hard hit. And it's not something that the older Range Rovers used to do, certainly not to this extent. They used to just glide a little bit more like a Bentley or a Rolls Royce over some of the toughest sort of bumps and lumps in the road. And, and in the UK, especially in the countryside, where the roads are really bumpy and lumpy, you do notice it an awful lot. Here's just a relatively small pothole on the road. If we go over it, it kind of knocks you in your seat, which you would expect from a smaller car, like my Nissan Pixo, for example. If you go over a, a bump or a speed hump or anything like that, you certainly know about it, but you also do in this, and I don't feel like it should be that way. It's really strange. It's almost like it takes the suspension quite a long time to calibrate. Now, I don't know if anyone else will agree with me here, uh, who, who's experienced it for themselves, but if you find yourself on a very bumpy stretch, say if I was to go and find a cobbled street now and drive across that, after a few seconds, it would sort of balance and actually then it is quite a, a pleasant ride across a rough surface, but it's when it gets something unexpected, when you hit a, a speed bump or a, a large pothole and the car's not ready for it, it sort of goes into like a, a tense mode like a scared cat and it goes Ugh! like that it goes all rigid and you smack into the bump 
and it gives a really unpleasant ride for you and all your passengers. It's strange, it, it might be a calibration thing because there's certainly plenty of suspension travel for it to be able to deal with it. Um, it's just odd, you know, on, on this road, so we're sort of bouncing along here, it's quite a bumpy road, 45 miles an hour, it, it, it's sort of soaking it up quite nicely. It's just when we hit this hold and it goes donk, it doesn't seem to cope so well. So call me a nitpicker, but it is one of the reasons you buy a Range Rover is for that ultimate comfort and, and smooth ride. And it certainly excels in the noise department. You know, you can have a whisper conversation with your passengers in the back, which is lovely. And uh, <laughs> it'll kill me for saying this, as my parents get more senile, that's gonna be, <laughs> that's gonna be more important. <laughs> but, but yeah, in, in the ride quality area, I feel like I'm a little bit disappointed by this car. And I have to say, I don't remember that being as much of a concern with the L460. These Range Rovers had had slightly fidgety suspension before now, but uh, this Sport is the worst I've, I've noticed. So interested to know your opinions on it, but it's something I would really consider. If you're thinking about buying one of these cars, definitely take it on a, a test drive and try and go over your sort of local speed bumps and see what you think, because it is something that would put me off this car completely. The engine though, is just an absolute, <laughs> I, I cannot believe engines these days. So this is the D300, just under 300 horsepower, it's 300 PS, a bucket load of torque, I think somewhere in the five or 600 Newton meter range. On a run the other day, I managed to get 48 miles per gallon. It wasn't just 200 miles up the motorway, it was a mixed route. It was the route to my parents, it's about 50 miles, half of which is on the M25, the other half is on these sorts of 60 mile an hour country roads where you're not always able to do 60. And I averaged 48 miles per gallon, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Now, I freely admit I was trying to eke out uh, economy from the car, deliberately anticipating the road and, you know, not using the brake where I could help it and accelerating gently. But it wasn't that difficult to get 48 miles per gallon. Now that I'm paying no attention and we've averaged 16 miles an hour, we're up to 28 mpg. But imagine by the end of this filming segment I've done, it'll be at least in the mid 30s. But not only that, it's super fast as well. And I, do you know what? I wouldn't do this ever in a Range Rover. I'm not going to launch it, but what I will do is go down to like 10 miles per hour, which I've done now, and I'm just going to floor it. You guys can see the speed there. Let's go 10 miles an hour. And there's 60. It's really fast, actually. I think the, the quoted time is 0 to 60 in six and a half seconds or something like that. But that is I mean, it pushes you in the back of your seat. You really don't expect it. And there is almost every model higher than this. It is quicker. You've got the D350, of course, which is a little bit more powerful version of, of this one. And then you've got the hybrid petrols and, and the big the V8 stuff as well, um, which is even quicker. Now, I'm not saying you need anything faster than this because you certainly don't. In fact, I think this is a fantastic balance of fuel economy and performance and I have to say 99% of the time you don't ever put your foot down in this thing you never need to because that sort of third way down the pedal gives you all of the torque and acceleration you're ever going to want but when you do occasionally just want to jump out of a junction or you've got a short slip road it really takes you back quite literally and surprises you at how quick this thing is is to move and it does feel uh, significantly faster than the D300 L460 and I think that's due to the, to the reduction in weight with this sport. Not much, but it seems to make a difference. So to recap, I am extremely impressed. The car is incredibly comfortable. These seats are amazing. The quality of all the materials in here feels fantastic. I like how they seem to have improved the responsiveness of the controls on the steering wheel. The D300 engine, I didn't really warm for it that much in the full-size car, but in this, I think it really works. I found it enjoyable to drive and it's extremely economical as well. 40 plus miles per gallon is easy to get. The main gripe I have with the car, other than the ride quality being firm when it's hit with something a little bit unexpected, is the steering. Now, when you first get in this car and you know leave your driveway or go around town, you're a little bit taken back about how heavy the steering is. It feels 
pretty heavy. It's not as light as you would like it to be, but it's all artificially added in weight to try and improve stability at speed. And the faster you get in this car, the stiffer the steering gets. Now that is on the surface a, a reassuring thing and it's quite nice to have. It means say on the motorway at 70 miles an hour, you really don't need to put any input into the wheel. It will hold you steady. But I find that that's really problematic because I don't know about you, I do make lots of minor adjustments and corrections when I'm driving, especially on the motorway, to keep myself in the middle of the lane or even when I want to pull back into the left. You know, you need to do those small adjustments on the steering wheel. And at 60, 70 plus mile per hour, the artificial weight that's added to the wheel is almost unbearable. I find it really, really strenuous and tiring to drive this car on the motorway for any length of time. I'm slightly exaggerating just to drill the point in. Of course, if you told me I had to drive 300 miles in this car right now, I would do it very happily. But you can't sort of just relax on the wheel. You constantly feel like you're fighting it because of this artificial weight. The best way I can describe it, it's not like heavy like a car with no power steering. It's like if you imagine you were trying to uncompress a spring with your hands. There's a real tension in the middle. And like I say, the faster you get, the tighter that gets. So it does just mean you want to change lane at 70 miles per hour, which is a thing you're going to be doing all the time on the motorway. Uh, you might just want to sort of use your thumb or whatever that you're resting on the wheel to just tick the car over into the next lane. But you sort of feel like, oh no, I need two hands for that because it's quite a heavy job. It's a hard thing to obviously talk about without you guys experiencing it yourself. But if you are an owner of either this or the L460, I'd love to hear if you agree with me because I just cannot understand. So much so I really, if this was my car, I would be driving it to the dealer to see if there was anything they can do about it. Now I know in uh, higher specified examples of this car, uh, one of the things you can option is a configuration menu. So you can adjust things like steering and, and put them into lighter settings. But I don't know if that would sort of remove or offset this added synthetic weight that JLR have, have put into this car. It makes the car feel more stable, yes, but I just literally sit here driving along wishing it had hydraulic steering or it was like the old L322 or even L405 where you know, it would just bounce along and wobble along in your hands, but it was so much more connective and easier to, to drive with. And I know it might sound pedantic, but this steering issue that these new Range Rovers have, it, it is genuinely enough to put me off buying one of these cars. I really cannot get on with it. Under 30 miles an hour, it's perfectly livable. It's light enough. I'd still like it to be a bit lighter or, or looser but it's fine. But it's just when you get up to those motorway speeds, 60 plus, I'd say, um, it becomes really distracting and annoying. And like I say, enough for me to look at BMW X5s or Audi Q7s. Uh, it's a real shame. And I think it's probably something that can be sorted with a software update because that's all it is. It's, it's software and it's electronics. And I don't know if I went to a dealer now and said, hi, can you switch this off and change it? I don't know if they'd be able to do that or if they'd even recognize it as an issue. Maybe it's just me, but I find it ever so disappointing. It ruins the car for me completely. It is that bad. So yeah, on that conclusion, fantastic car. At the moment, I really think that you should consider the Sport, despite the looks not being quite as good. I still way prefer the way the back of the new uh, L460 Range Rover looks, as opposed to this Sport. But actually after living with the car for a while, I'm sort of over that anyway. You still get the same driving position, the nice view over the top and everywhere with all the glass. So I'd happily have the Sport over the full size in terms of the appearance. And you're saving 20 grand at least in terms of spec to spec by it being a sport. And in terms of the driving, uh, drivability, or any of the features that you get, it's more or less identical. And if anything, you get slightly better fuel economy and performance by having the lighter choice. So 
if you have decided you're going to get one of these new Range Rovers, I genuinely consider the, the Sport. It, it's a really, uh, really great bit of kit and I think actually good value. I just really hope they do something about that steering. I hope you found this video interesting. Uh, if you're someone that's bought one of these cars, I really, I really want to hear your opinions because you will honestly have, have lived with it for longer than me and perhaps you have completely different opinions. So I want to hear them. Also, if you're considering one of these cars, uh, I encourage you to go and drive one and see what you think. It is a wonderful car and depending on what you're coming from, you're going to be sold instantly. And for those of you that haven't driven one of these, hopefully it's giving you a little bit of an insight into what it's like. But if you are in that group and you do want to try one of them for yourself, I can genuinely recommend the Out as a way of doing that. They can deliver cars straight to your door. It's hassle-free actually, because everything is included from additional drivers to insurance, and it's just a brilliant, brilliant experience. So do go and check out the Out. Link will be in the description of this video. And until next time, I will see you all very, very soon.